Uh, good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the, the latest of our What If series. My name is Paul Fleming. I'm the Pro Vice Chancellor for Science uh, here at, at the university, and it's my uh, pleasure this evening to introduce the, this particular lecture, which is entitled What If Cycling Was Safer Than Driving? I'd like to introduce to you this evening Professor Simon Kingham. Uh, Professor Kingham is the, uh, the Deputy he Head of Geography here uh, at the University. He's the Director of the Ministry of Health and the University, and he undertakes geospatial health research. He previously worked and studied in the United Kingdom, and he came to New Zealand in 2000. He's done a variety of projects related to transport and health uh, over a number of years, including projects funded by the European Union and here in New Zealand by the Foundation for Research, Science and Technology, by the Ministry of Health, by the Ministry of Transport and the Ministry of the Environment. Most recently, he has completed two projects funded in New, uh, by New Zealand Transport Agency, uh, with both having a focus on cycling and these will be referred to in his talk. He's a, comu a commuter cyclist, he's a parent, and he's a season ticket holder at the rugby, uh, with Crusaders and, and Canterbury ITM Cup very much in his mind. Just as he comes, let me remind you that if we do have any uh, unfortunate type of shaking or smoke or anything else, we will leave by uh, this exit here, and we head that direction down towards Arts. It gives me very great pleasure now to welcome Professor Simon Kingham to the platform. Thank you. I used to actually manage to walk to the rugby because I'm, the old stadium was a little bit closer than now. It's a little bit too far. So anyway, so I'm going to talk today about what if cycling were safer than driving. I just want to tell you a little bit more about myself. So I am a commuter and utility cyclist, and as you can see, I try and encourage my kids to cycle. They're a wee bit older than that now. They're now nine and uh, seven. I'm also a teacher and researcher, as Paul said, and, and I guess one of the focuses of my research over the years has been in kind of transport um, and health. I'm also, I've also, through my university work, I guess, I've become, I've been, I'm on the Regional Transport Committee, which is a local committee um, that kind of directs local transport policy. It's a committee of environment Canterbury, but it includes a number of people from uh, local councils as well. And I was on the thing called the Urban Development Strategy Forum. And I guess through all those, I've learnt a lot of stuff. And I would therefore say I'm an advocate for cycling, but I'm not an advocate because I want to wear Lycra and go out and take on cars and stuff. I'm an advocate because, to me, all the evidence says I should be an advocate. And so if I've learnt all this stuff about transport and health and cycling, I should actually do something about it. I shouldn't just be what, I guess, perhaps is a stereotypical academic and, and sit in my ivory tower and not tell you all about it. So I guess I, I take any opportunity I can to go out and tell people what, what the research says about these sorts of things, um, because I think it's actually what the purpose of, of being an academic and working at a university is all about. So how safe is cycling? I guess that's the first question. Is it, is it a safe form of transport? Is it a safe way to travel? So what I'm going to take you to is the Ministry of Transport's main document on this. So they produce um, crash statistics every year for various modes of transport. And this is their document on uh, crash statistics for cycling. And up front, this is the first thing you see. This is the graph. It shows you this is deaths or injuries per million hours spent traveling. And it says that if you travel by motorcycle, um, there are 226 deaths or injuries in motor vehicle crashes per million hours spent traveling. If you're a cyclist, it's down at 31. If you're a driver of a motor vehicle, 10. Passenger, 7. Pedestrians, and then bus passengers. What it seems to say is that if you really care about your health, you won't use a motorbike because you're most likely to be injured or die on a motorbike. But that cycling seems to be three times as dangerous as traveling in a car. So you could say that that's the end of the lecture because clearly cycling is very unsafe and we can all go home now. But there are other ways of looking at it. Also, what's interesting is, before you get to that figure, there is one paragraph of text on that document, which is kind of the Ministry of Transport's signal to us about how dangerous cycling is. And it says, cyclings have a number of risk factors that don't affect car drivers, um, that they're unstable. I don't think, I think it means um, physically unstable, not mentally unstable, but they're unstable. Uh, they don't have much protection. Uh, they're less visible, and all this means that cycling is really dangerous. So the message is very clearly cycling is very dangerous. What, of course, they don't tell you here is that we know that a large number of accidents are caused by speed, 
And according to the newspaper, I think I read something this week, quite a large number of them are caused by drug and alcohol use. Now, speed is generally not a thing cyclists cause accidents by, because most of them don't cycle very fast. Drug and alcohol, possibly. But of course, what this doesn't tell you is that, yes, cyclists have higher rates of accidents, but they rarely cause them. And if you go further into their documents, it actually tells you that 63% the cyclist is not at fault at all, and only in 23% is the cyclist the main fault. Now, oh, there we go. And 14% the cyclist is a bit responsible for. So we know that cycling is dangerous, but it's actually dangerous not because of cyclists, but because of the other people on the road who result in 63% of these injuries or fatalities. We also know a few other things. This is one of my, co my colleague, Glenn Curry in engineering, has done some research. And we know that your risk varies according to your age. So generally, the older you get, the less risky cycling gets. Uh, although there is a peak at later age, and Glenn's suggestion is that there's suddenly these kind of people who are a little bit older decide that cycling is what they want to do, and they haven't cycled for years. I wasn't looking at you, Paul, Pro Vice Chancellor. <laughs> but they suddenly think cycling is what they want to do, and they jump on their bikes, and they haven't cycled for years, and they kind of have accidents. Another interesting one is that when you start looking at the data, if you're a 15 to 19 year old car driver, your risk is actually twice that for cyclists. Now, we know for most of the time, being a cyclist is riskier. You're more likely to have an accident. For that age group, you are twice as likely to have an accident as a car driver compared to cyclists. We know, according to Glenn's research, that the accident rates vary according to where you're traveling. We know that um, cycle accidents are more likely to happen on urban roads. Uh, and in fact, you're, as a cyclist, you're five times as likely to have a risk than, than a car on an urban state highway. So that's a state highway in a city. Now, the reason for this, of course, is actually partly a little bit misleading because we know that they are higher on urban roads because virtually very few cyclists actually cycle on roads out in the country relatively. And so particularly when you look at motorways, it says motorways are the safest place to cycle. And of course, it's their safest place to cycle because no cyclist in their right mind would cycle on a motorway. So there are, you have to be careful about the way you interpret statistics and look at this. They also vary with experience. So the other group that is a higher risk is basically new cyclists, people who think the first time you go out and cycle, you're actually at a higher risk, which does create some problems which we'll allude to later. So there's lots of variation in risk. The other thing that's worth noting is this is uh, Ministry of Transport, another document. This document's an interesting one because there's no text. It's just a series of figures and tables. It says motor vehicle crashes. And if you look, cyclists are right up the top. So actually, if you look at proportion of deaths, Yes, cyclists have a high risk, but the chance of you being one is actually very small because they actually account for a very, very small proportion of, of um, vehicle crashes. So they're right up here. So in fact, your greatest likelihood of having a crash is if you're a car driver or a pedestrian or a motorcyclist, uh, but not if you're a cyclist because you're a very small proportion. We can look at it other ways. So if we start manipulating and playing with the data, as a car passenger or driver, there are 155 million vehicle kilometers traveled per fatality. For a cyclist, 31 million kilometers cycled per fatality. What it means is you've actually got to cycle quite a long way before you statistically are likely to die on the roads. Now, it doesn't mean that I might cycle home tonight and something dreadful might happen, but statistically, I'd have to cycle 31 million kilometers before I'm likely to die on the roads on my bike. But on average, this is what I'm talking about. This is statistical averages. This is taking the number of kilometers people cycle and the number of fatalities. So it's purely averages. It's not taking into account the fact that I'm a new or an old cyclist or an inexperienced one. If you put that into hours, you have to, the average is one fatality every 4.2 million hours of travel. And for a cyclist, it's 2.7 million hours of travel. These are averages. What we can, of course, do is actually get even cleverer with our statistics, and we can actually work out, well, on average, we all drive around 7,500 kilometers per year, and on average, we cycle 77 kilometers. Now, if you do that, so you divide the other figures by that, actually, uh, years of travel per fatality for the car is 14,400, and it's actually 400,000 years. So that is, now, of course, that is completely misleading. <laughs> because the vast majority of people cycle no kilometers, and some people cycle quite a lot of kilometers. Now, if we do that, 
If you take a cyclist who cycles every day to and from work, and say their journey is five kilometers, they cycle 46 weeks, 100 kilometers a week, their years before the light of a fatality is 6,700. So that is more, lead, um, more accurate to actually look at. That is technically correct. I've not lied with that statistic, but I have intended to mislead you. So what should we summarize? Well, there are lies, damn lies, and statistics. And the reality is that the Ministry of Transport presents their statistics in a way that tells us that cycling is very dangerous. I've just shown you that you can present statistics in a very different way and show that cycling is actually not very dangerous. Yes, you are more likely to, you are more likely to die or be injured in a car than on a bike, by pure virtue of the fact that more people die in cars than die on a bike. However, per hour or per kilometer, your risk of accident is undoubtedly greater if traveling by bike than by car. So for the amount you travel, it is undoubtedly true that your risk is higher. But the reality is that the chances of someone dying in a car or uh, on a bicycle is very slim. On a bike, around 10 people a year die. Now, that's very sad for those 10 people and their families. But statistically, you have to travel a long time before that's likely to happen. So statistically, none of us are likely to die in a car or on a bike. Another point worth knowing is that there's a lot of evidence that there is safety in numbers. So in places where more people cycle, accident rates decline. And the idea is that with lots more cyclists, cyclists become more visible. So if there's only one person, they're quite difficult to spot. If there's 40 people or 100 people, much easier to spot. Secondly, we also know that if more people cycle, then everyone who is driving a car is also more likely to be a cyclist. And therefore, if you are a cyclist, and you drive a car, you are probably more on the lookout and more aware, and perhaps, dare I say, more considerate of other people in bikes. Now, there's lots of evidence to support this. This is some figures showing we've got the Netherlands and Denmark, and they are the countries with the highest rates of cycling in the world, the US and the UK, and the US particularly has relatively low rates of cycling, and what you've got is you've got cyclists killed per 100 million kilometer cycle and cycle, cyclists injured, and for both of them, what you see is in the countries where you've got lots of people cycling, you have much lower rates of accidents. In countries where not many people cycle, you have much higher rates. So clearly what's happening is, in countries where more people bike, the accident rates are much, much lower. We can look at this another way. This is data from the Netherlands. What we've got here is the number of people cycling. This is bike use, and this is cyclists killed, and this is as per billion kilometers traveled. So this is a rate. What you see is that in the time when, when you have lots of people cycling here, you had low rates. When cycle numbers declined in the late 70s, the rate of accidents increased. What happened in the late 70s in the Netherlands is we had an oil crisis. The Dutch uh, government said, what are we going to do about this? There's some problems. They also had cases where a number of cyclists were getting killed. And so the Dutch government invested heavily in cycling and a lot of money in infrastructure. And the number of cycling increased. And as the number of cycling increased, the rates of accidents decreased. So again, very, very clear relationship. More people cycle, the, the less or lower the accident rates. We can also see this in Portland. Portland is one of the examples I'll occasionally mention in the United States. And it's the number one city in the United States for cycling. What you have here is um, this is a, an indicator. This is traffic across one particular bridge. This is accident cy reported cycle rates. And this is an indexed bike crash rate. So this is rate, number of accidents per cyclist. And as the number of cyclists go up, which are these gray bars, the rate of accidents drops quite significantly. And the number obviously stays the same, but the rate is declining. So again, in three different examples, we can see that the more people who cycle, the lower the rate. And so that, therefore, is, is obviously a good thing in terms of encouraging people to cycle. What about relative risk? So what I hope we've got so far is that, yes, cycling is more dangerous per hour and per kilometer traveled than driving a car. But it's not, I would argue, a particularly risky thing to do when you compare it to the chances of you actually dying or having an accident. What about compared to other activities? What about compared to other things that might kill us? And I apologize that this is um, not a very cheery topic at the moment, but it gets better. How risky is cycling compared to other things? This is some data. Relative risk of, to cycling based on fatality rates per participant. There's cycling, so one fatality, this is a relative risk per participant of one. Now it's about the same as playing golf. But it's slightly less risky to playing tennis, football, athletics, swimming, horse riding, fishing, or motorsports. And if you get to climbing and air sports, you're just in big trouble. So relatively to these other activities people engage in, 
Cycling actually doesn't look particularly dangerous. Otherwise, we can look at it. What about deaths per year? This is deaths per year, so we've got cycling here. We've got all transport, people dying at home, other accidents, obesity, heart disease, etc. So as you can see, the number of people dying as cyclists is much lower than the chances of dying from some of these other conditions. And I will talk more in a minute about obesity and heart conditions related to inactivity. So as you can see, relatively, yes, it is more dangerous than driving, except in the total numbers, you're actually more likely to die in a car or be injured. Relative risk, again, this is from the National Security. Just one other point worth mentioning. This is a website, so we have to question the data, I guess, and it's on cycle helmets, which I'm not going to talk about. Um, so you kind of think, well, where do they get the data from? This is the National Safety Council, an American organization, so a slightly more reliable data. This is chances of dying from something. 16% chance of dying from heart disease, 14% from cancer, stroke, etc. We go down. Eventually, we get to cycling. 0.02% chance of dying as a result of cycling in an accident. So again, if we look at relative risk, yes, it might not be as safe as being in a car per kilometer traveled, but you're much higher chance of dying from a number of other things. And it's worth looking at these ones because we're going to talk about heart disease, cancer, and stroke indirectly in, in, in a minute. So you can see it's actually a very low chance of being the cause of your death. One of the things that we've talked about a bit is inactivity leading to obesity. And this is one of the big arguments that people say why we should encourage cycling. This is some rates. This is year. We've got 1970 through to 2005. Percent of people obese, different countries. And other than Japan, every single country is getting more obese over the years. These are figures that probably most of us are familiar with. So we've got England, Finland, various countries. And except Japan, every other country is increasing rates of obesity. But it's okay, because we all know that's to do with diet, don't we? Oh, that's all right, we'll talk about diet in a minute. It also happens in New Zealand. We've got the same, not quite so clear, but we've got a rate, um, an increase here. So we've got men. This is going back from 1997 to 2007, so it's a 10 year period. And we can see obesity rates for men and women increasing. So we're actually no better than the rest of the world. We can't sit there and say, well, we're different. We all live in the country and do exciting outdoorsy stuff. The reality is we are also getting more obese as a nation. This is what the New Zealand Heart Foundation medical director said um, a couple of years ago. New Zealand is in the grip of a global obesity epidemic, the future costs of which will be enormous, potentially unavoidable for the health system. Um, we are not immune from this, as I pointed out in the previous um, slide. New Zealand is very much um, facing the obesity crisis. And this becomes important when we start looking at uh, broader health costs, and I'll come on to them in a minute. So what is what results in obesity? This is very simple. This is what we should be, neutral calorie balance. So we eat a bit and we do the same amount of exercise and we don't change our weight. If we um, only eat carrots, also if we eat lots of chips and we just sit around reading a book, we'll gain weight. And if we eat carrots and cycle, we'll lose weight. This is fairly standard. And so there's two sides to this equation. And it's important to understand the two sides. One side is what we eat and one side is exercise. And assuming we're all in that perfect equilibrium, we want to maintain them. Otherwise, we lose weight or we gain weight. I went to an interesting conference a couple of years ago where a French guy produced this graph, and it showed the hours of physical activity per day for France. I think this is slightly smoothed. I suspect it is, because it looks immaculately smooth. 1,800 people on average in France were getting nine hours of exercise a day. By the time we got to 2010, we were down to one. So the reality is that we are becoming less active. Now, the question then is, how important is that relative to diet and what we eat? Some interesting research being done. This dark line here is obesity rates. It's the same on the both graphs. This is some research done in 95, but the similar patterns are being found now. This is energy intake and fat intake, and what you can see is they're actually not going up. Recent evidence is that the amount of food in terms of fat and energy we're eating is not actually going up necessarily. There's a slightly contested debate. Some people argue it's different types of food. Some people argue it is. But generally, most people would say we're not eating an increasing amount of calories. So what is explaining this increase in obesity? There's also, this is an, this, this, in this particular journal, they presented cars per household, and they've got television viewing in hours per week. Now, both of these are in, in there as surrogates of inactivity. In other words, we're getting more cars, and we're using cars more and we're sitting watching TV and computers, et cetera, more. 
And so what this is clearly saying is that the problem is, is still diet, but it might not be the main problem, and the main problem might be inactivity. So then one way of looking at that, another way of looking at that, might be saying, well, let's look at which countries are the most active and see if they, and, and then look at their obesity rates. This is different countries. We have obesity prevalence here, and we have walk, bike, and transit trips. So this is trips that are not by car, and what you can see is a lovely, almost perfectly inverse relationship. Proudly sitting at the top here with the people who do the less trips, walking and cycling, uh, is the Americans, and they have the most number of people obese. Australia does pretty well too. You look at the other end, you've got Spain, the Netherlands, Sweden, um, and some of the European countries, and they have much lower rates of obesity and much higher rates of active and public transport use. So suddenly we're seeing a link, not just between inactivity, but between inactivity um, activity as measured by the way we choose to travel. So walking and cycling and public transport. So what this clearly seems to be saying is, yes, activity and transport and the way we choose to travel are actually really important. And of course, this is really important in terms of walking and cycling. Where is New Zealand on that grade? Ah, now someone did put New Zealand. We're about here somewhere. We're pretty low. We're just near Australia. Somebody actually gave me some figures for Christchurch and we're about here. We're almost exactly on the line. I should have presented that one. Very good question. So Christchurch is in here somewhere. Now, why are we interested in obesity? Why do we talk about obesity? Um, obesity has links to a number of other health conditions. It's not that obesity in, in itself is the, hand out, the end outcome that we're most interested in. We're interested in a whole range of other things. So obesity is linked to cancer, hypertension, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. A whole bunch of conditions. Uh, cancer and heart failure, if you remember from that, and stroke are the three things that are most likely to kill us, if you remember from our earlier figures. So the three things that are most likely to kill us are related to obesity. So as you can see, we're starting to get a picture that perhaps a risky thing to do is not be active. In other words, maybe cycling is not a thing that is very unsafe, but it's actually a thing that reduces our, ri our risk um, of getting some of these diseases. So what are the health benefits of cycling? The main one that people talk about, and there's a lot of research, and I'll come on to some research in a minute, is physical activity, and that leads to obesity, heart disease, cancer, mortality, etc. Some research by some Danes now 10 years ago identified that once you controlled for everything else, people who cycle to work reduced their risk of mortality by 40%. There's a study I also read recently that showed that people who cycle to work reduce their absentee rates, which I'm sure will be very interesting for the vice chancellor to, to note down, because then we'll all be far more productive. There's also some research kind of looking at happiness that people who cycle are happier, and there's certainly evidence that kids who have exercise before they get to school work better at school. So there's a whole bunch of other ones. There's other things related to community and social capital. This is less research, but I think something that's very interesting, that if you cycle and walk, you are more likely to see your neighbours, and if you're more likely to see your neighbours, then you develop strong community. And one of the things I think that came out of the earthquake is the communities that did better were the communities where people knew their neighbours. Now, the reality is you don't tend to talk to your neighbours if you jump in the car and you drive out the garage, but you do tend to talk to your neighbours when you walk and cycle. Now, this is an area that hasn't been researched an enormous amount, but there's certainly some stuff linking cycling to these sorts of things, which I think is really interesting. I just want to talk a wee bit about pollution exposure. Most people think um, that if you're in a car, you are protected from bad air quality. And I apologize for some of you who may have seen me talk about this before, but I think it's really interesting. So most people think that the car results in the quality of the air being really clean around you because you are protected. And I'm just going to dispel that myth. This is a study that we did in 2007, myself and some colleagues. Um, we did it for the New Zealand Transport Agency. And this is one of the studies that Paul Fleming uh, mentioned when he introduced me. What we did in this study, we measured some key traffic pollutants, carbon monoxide and particles. And the two ones I want you to, we're going to talk particularly about carbon monoxide and ultrafine particles. Ultrafine particles are interesting. They're very, very fine. Um, they get really deep into your lungs. And the reason we don't know much about them is they're very difficult to measure. But now we're starting to develop ways of measuring them. We know about these, these ones, but we know less about these. But the thinking is that these are the ones that do us most damage. The other interesting things about these is, they are very, very high when you are near vehicle fumes. You don't have to get far away for, them, for, them to, to, for the levels to drop off, because what happens to them is they kind of all join up. They coagulate, and they become bigger particles. And when they become bigger particles, they don't get quite so deep in your lung. We did a study in Christchurch in Auckland. We compared different commuting modes. We did cyclists on and off-road in Christchurch. 
and we did people traveling by car and people traveling by bus. And we did a route where we started out, uh, we, start, we went from the university into town and then we went from town out to Burwood. So we kind of did that. This is one of the routes. So this is, um, this is go going up from town. So we can, this is coming down the Great North Road and then down into town here. Great North Road, the North Road, the main road. And then this is someone cycling and they cycle down the cycle route that goes past Mona Vale, the rail trail. Now the darker the color, the higher the level of pollution. So what you can see is these are two cyclists who, who left the same time. They arrived roughly the same time. The person who went through the park and up through Mona Vale and along the rail trail had much lower levels of pollution. And what you can see here is you can see how the levels are much higher when, when the cyclist on the road went to a junction. So that's a visual way of looking at it. This is uh, for carbon monoxide. If we look at ultrafines, this is when we went from the town centre to the university. This is the cyclist who went through the park and then down the cycleway that goes past Boys and Girls High. And this is the cyclist who went down Rickerton Road. And you can see, again, much higher levels of pollution, particularly down this part of Rickerton Road. So the person travelling this way, much lower levels of pollution. Same journey, but this time we're looking at carbon monoxide, much higher on Rickerton Road, much lower off Rickerton Road. And again, even through town, much lower here than going down some of the, the busier roads. And ultrafine particles, again, same thing. This, these are much lower levels going along the rail track, much higher levels going on the main road. What you can see on this one is when the rail track um, crosses a main road, you actually get higher values. And this makes sense when we understand that ultrafine particles are very related to your proximity to traffic. We also did some um, interesting studies where we, we cycled up and down um, Hag Hackley Avenue. So this is alongside the park. We had one cyclist. We did this with three cyclists. We had one on the road, one on the pavement, uh, and one in the park. So they were roughly on the road, seven metres away, and 19 metres away. And what we're trying to do here is see how important is getting that distance away. Is 19 metres what we should be aspiring to, or is literally putting, it behind, putting the cycleway behind park cars enough? And this is really interesting because actually we think this is one of the first studies in the world that did this. Um, other studies have have not looked at the importance of proximity specifically for cyclists. What we see is going on the footpath just a few metres away reduces your exposure by around 30 plus percent. Going a bit further increases it again. But what's the interesting thing is that you get a significant reduction by just locating the cyclist just a few metres away from the road. So cyclists exposed to significantly less pollution than people in cars. We found that first. So even a, a cyclist and a car driver on the same bit of road traveling at the same time, the car driver was exposed to higher levels of pollution. And people ask me why. And the main reason is that if you're on a bike, you're rarely in a queue of traffic. You're either slower than the cars or you're faster than the cars. If you're in a car, and we did this study during commuter hours, so in the morning and afternoon rush hour, what you find is that most of the time there's a car in front of you. And a very clever design about cars is the exhaust is emitted, so the exhaust from a car comes out in exactly the place where your air intake draws exhaust um, fumes into your car. So it's a very clever design if you want to maximize pollution exposure. <laughs> so what you found is that this, and this is not, we're not the first study that's found this, we're the only study that's found this in New Zealand, but cars are exposed to significantly uh, more pollution than people riding bicycles. We also found that a very small amount of separation for cyclists, so just moving a cyclist a few meters away results in a significant reduction in exposure. And this has policy implications for the location of cycle infrastructure. So if you can just move cyclists a relatively short distance away, you reduce the pollution exposure quite significantly. If you factor in breathing rates, it does change. Because obviously, if you're exercising and you're cycling, you're breathing in more. Once you factor that in, it's probably slightly higher for cycling. There's no doubt that it's, you, as a cyclist, you're probably taking more pollution into your lungs by virtue of the fact you're exercising. We didn't test that in this study, but most studies around the world say it. But it's marginal. It's not conclusive. Um, and obviously, there's lots of other factors come in, like how fit the cyclist is, because the fitter the cyclist, then their breathing rate comes down as they exercise. So it's a slightly uh, complicated relationship. Other organizations have come up with other benefits. So this, person, this, this particular organization, the average person will lose 13 pounds in their first year of riding to work, which is quite good. I told one of my colleagues that he's very, very skinny, and he said he didn't want to cycle because he didn't want to lose 13 pounds. And he is ridiculously skinny and would possibly disappear. It also says on a round trip of 10 miles, cyclists save 10 pounds a day. It says studies have shown that homes uh, near a close cycle paths are more valuable, et cetera. So there's other, a whole range of other benefits associated with cycling. 
So what we know is that overall, what are the negatives of cycling? Well, we know that you are more likely to have an accident per kilometre or per hour of cycling. Pollution dose, you're probably going to get more stuff in your lungs once you factor in exercise. So they're the negatives. They are pretty much the only two negatives. The positives really are, these are this is the big one. Exercise, a lack of exercise, or the link between exercise and obesity. And as a result of that, we know that heart disease, cancer, life expectancy, work absenteeism, a whole range of health conditions are linked to inactivity. We know that there's some research saying people are happier when they cycle and things to do with social capital. So these are the good things, these are the bad things. The question then is, how important are these versus these? So what is the relative weighting? If, this, if, the, if the, wor the bad things are more significant than the good things, then cycling's bad for you. Now, if I thought that, I wouldn't be standing here, would I? Let's be honest. So you, you know what's going to happen next. There's been some studies that have tried to quantify this. Most of these studies have been done in the last five years, where people have said, what is the overall impact? Because the reality is that most people probably think that cycling is dangerous, and it's worse than car driving. So people have actually tried to look at all the factors and, and weigh them up. A study by some Dutch people, on average, the estimated health benefits of cycling were substantially larger than the risks relative to car driving for individual shifting. So if people shift their mode and they go from driving a car to cycling, overall, the health benefits are great for those people. In other words, this side is way more important than this side. Way more important. A second study, health benefit. This is a review of a number of studies that were done. They reviewed various studies. And their findings, they said, it demonstrated consistent dose response for improved function and health, provides strong support for the promotion of cycling for public health. Same finding. They said, when you look at all these studies around that the impacts on, on health of cycling, it comes out as very beneficial. Another one, this was done in New Zealand by some people at Auckland University. Um, the health benefits of moving from cars to bikes heavily outweigh the costs of injury from road crashes. So they said it's very clear. In New Zealand, it's the same thing. The benefits are great if you encourage more people to cycle. And that was a very neatly done study. What are some broader benefits? I'm, just, I'm not going to dwell on these too long. What are some of the broader benefits of cycling? Peak oil. Some people talk about peak oil. This is actually a quote from the head of Chevron. One thing is clear, the era of easy oil is over. Um, we've got to work out what we do now because we've reached the point where the oil is maximized. It's going to become more expensive and either we're going to run out or it's going to become really expensive and we're going to marginalize people who can't afford it. And in case you haven't quite got the message, there's another way of looking at it. Peak oil is here. It's happening. So obviously, more, less people driving cars, more people cycling helps the issue of peak oil. Climate change is obviously another one. Uh, vehicle emissions are very closely linked to climate change. And therefore, if we can get people cycling and out of their cars, then we, we're helping that problem too. And urban air pollution. Don't you think it's a lovely picture, eh? I got that. So I don't know who got that one. I found that on, someone put it on Facebook. We know that if we can get people out of their cars into bicycles, then they're not producing pollution as they're driving down the street. So there's a corporate kind of a message, as well as the fact we know it reduces their exposure, it reduces the amount being put into the environment. And congestion. If we can uh, get car one, one, some more people out of, out of um, cars onto bikes, it reduces congestion on the road, which helps everyone. It helps the people who need to drive, and it generally helps the problem, the situation. And some of you would have seen an image like this. This shows what 60 cars on a road looks like relative to 60 people in a bus and 60 people on bicycles. Uh, so as you can see, you can see the magnitude of, 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 con of how congestion can be helped if more people were to cycle. It's also economic sense. Um, there's some arguments. So some people have started studying the economic benefits. Is, can we actually find economic benefits of cycling? In the New Zealand's Transport Agency's Economic Evaluation uh, Manual, this until recently did not happen. This is only a couple of years old where they've come up with this figure. They've actually found that there are benefit for investing in cycling. In Australia, the cost of physical inactivity was estimated in 2006-07 at $1.5 billion. And we know that if we get more people cycling, we reduce that. Now, they're not specifically what we're necessarily looking at, but if we look um, at some studies in the UK. In the UK, a number of years ago, the government put a lot of um, investment into some cycling cities, and they invested in a number of towns. And they then assessed what happened. And they did a, an intervention in six demonstration towns, and they found for every $1 invested, there was £2.5 pound, pound invested, 
that's £2.59 benefit. So in other words, if you invest in cycling, you reap enormous benefits back. And it should be noted when we do these similar sorts of um, cost-benefit analyses in road building, you don't get benefit. This one reviewed a number of things, and they actually found, this one reviewed a number of studies, and it actually found a mean cost-benefit ratio of 5 to 1. Um, and this is de decreased mortality alone, so this looked at broader things. They actually found for every dollar you spent, you save $5. It makes enormous economic sense. And countries all around the world are starting to acknowledge this, and they're starting to invest in cycling because they realize that it's actually really good economic sense. So why don't people cycle? So far, you're probably thinking, well, of course everyone's going to cycle. It makes such sense. So why don't people cycle? Well, fortunately, we know the answer to that in Christchurch because a colleague, my colleague Glenn Curry and uh, Catherine Taylor, we did a study for the New Zealand Transport Agency. Uh, the research was done in 2009, so it's actually really relevant for Christchurch. It was done pre-earthquake. It was just done in Christchurch, so in many ways it's absolutely opportune timing. And it's available online. What we found is that the major barrier, by a long way, is people don't feel safe. You ask people, we, did, we used a number of surveys, we, did, we used existing surveys, and then we did focus groups. And the main barrier, by a mile, or a kilometre, because I'm in New Zealand now, not in Britain anymore, is people don't feel safe. That was easily the biggest one. Secondary ones, people say, well, if there was workplace showering and changing facilities, and if I enjoyed my journey. The reality is that the University of Canterbury, for example, has these to some extent, and it actually isn't the thing. The clear thing is this. So even if you put these in place, if you make the journey, if you put these in, people won't do it because of that. The enjoyment of the journey is very closely linked to this. If you don't feel safe, you're not going to enjoy your experience. So this is a secondary one linked to that. There's a whole bunch of other minor ones. People talked about these different types of things. I think this one is not having children. It's just not children. It's carrying children and transporting children. But the bottom line is you could fix all these. If you don't fix that one, no one's going to, people aren't going to cycle because they very clearly made the point that that's the one that stops them. What else did we find out on that study? We found out that people were prepared to cycle a bit longer for a nice journey. So the people, and what we did here, we spoke to and did focus groups with people who we thought could cycle but didn't cycle at the moment. So we identified them as the next 10%, the next group of people who might cycle. Uh, so they said they would if do a, uh, this, they'd travel a little bit further for a nice route. We then went on, and this is where Glenn Corey particularly came into his own because he's a civil engineer, we asked them specifically about infrastructure. One thing people said is they wanted it to be consistent. They wanted a continuous facility. They didn't want a beautiful kilometre of beautiful cycleway and then get thrown on some dreadful road. They wanted to know that they could get from A to B on nice infrastructure. They also said that they wanted to know that the facilities were the same across the city. What people said, and this is the one that completely surprised us, engineers, is anyone an engineer here before I'm a little bit rude? Right, I'm going to carry on then. Oh, well, I'm going to carry on anyway. Engineers are very good at engineering the best facility for a junction. So they, they come up to the junction and they go, ah, this is a junction. The best thing to do here is to do that and move them there. And, and I once saw this engineer come up with this horrific idea. Well, I thought it was horrific where he had traffic going in different directions and he worked out that cyclists could just get through the gap in the traffic and it was really efficient in terms of moving people around. No acknowledgement of the fact that it would have been absolutely petrifying for anyone doing it. But from an engineering perspective, it worked a treat. <laughs> what people said is, what we don't want to do is get to a junction and have to work out what to do. We don't want to kind of get there and have a little game, oh, what shall I do at this junction because it's different to the last one. They want to get there and know exactly what to do and they want to know that it's the same infrastructure as the junction that they got to earlier that looked the same. And that doesn't fit with engineering particularly because it isn't necessarily the best infrastructure for that junction, but people want it to be consistent. We then asked them a series of questions about specific type of infrastructure because we wanted to know what type of infrastructure do people want. So again, some of you may have seen this, so I apologise. What we did is we showed them graphs like this. So this is pavement, this is cycleway, it shows them where the cyclists go, so there's a cyclist and trucks and cars and other things. This is one example for an advanced stop box, which is where you have a little box at the front. So we showed them this sort of thing. And then we showed them some pictures to say what it would look like if they saw it, if they came across it. And then we asked them, how likely, or which of these would you cycle on if this was in place? So this is for mid-block facilities. So this is when you're cycling along. And we said, if there was no cycling provision, well, the, this number of people would frequently cycle. 
sometimes cycle, rarely cycle, not cycle at all. So that's not very popular, because what we're really looking for, bearing in mind that this is the next 10% of people, this is the people who said, I'd kind of like to cycle. It's not the people who said, hell will freeze over before I get on a bike. We're not looking at them, we're only looking at the people who said, I kind of like the idea of cycling, but I just don't think I want to at the moment. So these are the next group. So we're not, we need this green bit to be pretty much over here, because we've already got down to the people who are most likely to cycle. So no cycling provision, not very attractive. A cycle lane, which is what we have a bit of now. Nah, not good. Cycle lane with a bit of highlighting. Uh, still not great up here. A curved cycle lane. Well, we're getting better. The behind parking, we're, yeah, we're doing okay. And with separation, good separation, we're getting some good results here. So what's clearly happening here is people want to be separated from traffic. So this conf confirms what we'd already thought. But when we actually ask them, very much what they want. Do they like shared paths? No, nah, not really. People don't want to be on the pavement with pedestrians. And when you talk to pedestrians, they don't want to be on the pavement with, with cyclists. Particularly, you talk to disability people, and they say, we do not want cyclists on pavements with people who have mobility issues. So it's quite a big issue. What about when you're, um, you come to an intersection, you're going straight ahead. So that's when you, you're at a traffic light, and you just want to go straight on. What sort of infrastructure do you want? Nothing, not very popular. A cycle lane with a bit of paint, not very popular. Um, pedestrians going with general traffic signals, so you've got so you cycle path oh, going along with, with general traffic signals, not very popular. Cycle path where you've got your own signal, where you've got your own signal, that's the one people like. And again, it's because people don't want to be going through junctions with cars, they want to go through it on their own. So again, they want separation. What about when you turn right? This is the tricky one. Nothing, not popular. Right turning lane, so you actually go in the right turning lane with a car. Nah, not very popular. A cycle lane, so you've seen these sorts of things. Mm, not that popular. An advanced stop box, this is the picture I showed you earlier. Oh, a little bit more, but not great. People really like these things, hook turns. The idea is you go straight on, you stop there, and then you go across. This surprised us, and this was interesting. Existing cyclists don't like that. People who cycle at the moment, they go, I don't like that, it's going to slow me down. People who don't cycle go, I don't care about being slowed down, I want to be safe. This surprised us. There is a couple of these. It's interesting, I, I do um, a slightly nerdy thing occasionally because I know there's one near where I live and I get there and I know what it is. And I only know what it is because Glenn Curry, my engineering colleague, told me. And I asked people, do you know what this is? And they go, no idea. So there's a, there, are advanced, there are these things, hook turns, but there's no signs at the moment telling you what they are so people don't know what they are. That's another message in that. If you're going to put something in place, you need to tell people what it is. And head start lights. That's what people like best. That is where you get to the front, you have your own lane, and you get your own traffic signal. Very clearly, again, people are saying, I want to be free, I don't want to be doing this with, with traffic, I want to be doing this on my own. And so this allows people to be separated and, and away from traffic. Roundabouts, we asked them about roundabouts. Uh, no provision, oops, no. A cycle lane, we don't have any of those, they have them in parts of Europe. Quite difficult finding a photo in New Zealand. Still not very popular. A cycle lane where you've kind of got direction, uh, a cycle lane where you, actually, where you go off the pavement, so you, you're not on the road, but then you have to stop. Um, oh, a little bit more. A cycle lane where you're off the road and you actually have priority. Now, they have them in Netherlands and places. You talk to engineers about this and they're horrified. They look at it and all they see is danger and risk. What happens in places where they do have them in parts of Europe is people get used to them and they work. If you suddenly put one of those on... Rickerton Avenue, Dean's Avenue, there would be carnage, I guarantee it. If you put good signage and you educated people over time, they would work really well. But engineers don't like it because they think, what would happen tomorrow? What's interesting is people who don't cycle loved underpasses. Engineers, well, policymakers don't like them because they're really expensive. Secure, safety people don't really like them because there's issues with safety, but people really like them. And the reason, again, is, is because they say, I can cycle without being near traffic, and that's what I want. So, what we clearly find is that perceived danger is the main barrier. It's not actual danger, because we know from the earlier things I've shown you that actually it's not that dangerous cycling relative to other things in our life. But people feel it's dangerous. And the reality is that you can make the roads as safe as possible, and people will not cycle unless they feel they are safe. So there's a very clear distinction between danger and perceived danger. And if we want to get more people cycling, it's perceived danger we have to deal with. If we, if we think the biggest thing for us is making roads safe, we would not allow cyclists on them. You wouldn't have any accidents of cyclists on the road if you didn't allow cyclists. 
But of course, what we're trying to do is encourage more people. So we actually need to do this. We need to reduce people's perception of danger. And the key to that is getting them off-road. Um, so getting off nice off-road routes. And when it's on-road, giving them physical separation. So if our aim is to get more people cycling, the reality, the thing we have to do is allow people to cycle without being near traffic. And they need some sort of physical separation. So how do we encourage more people to use the bike? Well, we're starting to get some ideas of that, I think. Some research, a guy called John Poocher, who's done a lot of research on cycling over the years, an American guy, says that you, can, you require an integrated package of things, complementary interventions. You need some infrastructure. You need bike programs. You need land use planning. You need restrictions on car use. He's saying, generally, most examples in the world where you get best success, you have a range of different things. What about infrastructure? Is it the key? I think a number of cities in the world, a number of people would say that if you do this without good infrastructure, nothing will happen. So you can spend millions of dollars with nice marketing campaigns, and you can do nice things on pro-bike programs, and you can do all this other stuff, but if you don't make it safe or feel safe, you're not going to achieve anything. And so there's a, there's a mantra that comes out called build it and they will come, and it's now being applied to cycle infrastructure programs all around the world. This guy is a guy called Roger Geller. Um, and he is the bike planner at Portland, and Portland is the cycling city in the US. Interestingly, the rates of cycling are actually only marginally higher than Christchurch. Now, to me, that actually does not say Portland's not doing a good job. It actually shows that where we are, what we could do if we did something decent about it, and I'll come on to that in a sec. I've seen pictures like this of Roger, Roger Geller, and I thought, he doesn't really cycle like that, does he? Where's his light crew and his waterproof? So last year, I was fortunate to go on a, on a, a non-university funded trip, in case the vice chancellor's listening. So it was not funded by the university. No, it was funded by an Erskine scheme. So it's a bequest. It's really good. It's a way of developing teaching material. And I went to, amongst other places, Portland. And I met Roger Geller, and I'd met him at a conference. And he took me around. And you know what? He dresses like that when he goes cycling every day. He has this hat. He just kind of tucks his trousers in. He wears a jacket and a suit. The day I went out with him, it poured with rain. And, and I just got wet. And he produced this amazing cape. And so he goes with his flat cap and his jacket, and he has this amazing cape, and he just cycles around. And to me, it's a perfect example. I kind of thought, well, this is a stage photo, and he doesn't really do that, but he actually does. He's, he's an amazing guy. And he absolutely is adamant that um, you build infrastructure and people use it. And I was at a conference in Vancouver on the same trip, a cycling conference, and there was a number of talks from people in different cities all around the world, and every one of them agreed if you build good infrastructure, people use it. Because some people argue, oh, well, it's expensive and people might not use it because we might not get this and that right. The reality is that every single city I've ever seen where people have built stuff, the, the planners afterwards say people use it. The problem with that, of course, is that that mantra actually also works for highway projects. So that if you build more highway projects, you actually attract more cars. And Currently, our government is spending billions of dollars on motorways. And what saddens me is that the research from all around the world is that if you build more motorways, you attract more people onto, into their cars. Because what we know is there's a thing called latent demand. And if you free up roads and you make them empty, people get in their cars and use them. And if you make roads a little bit congested, some people make the decision not to travel on them because they don't like traveling in congestion. Or they travel at different times. Or ultimately, if you get this right, and you have a little bit of congestion, people go, well, the bike path looks good, and I don't like sitting in the car. And so a small number of people um, get on their bikes. And actually, it's all, all you need is a small number of people, and you start curing some of the big problems we've got in society in terms of transport. So can Christchurch, or will Christchurch, be built as a city for the bicycle? Now, on Friday, Glenn Curry is doing a talk, I think about 6 o'clock, just out here. And he's going to talk about detail. He's an engineer, and he's going to look at some of the detail of the engineering around it. Um, so if anyone wants to know the detail, come and see Glenn. I'm not an engineer, I'm a geographer, so I, I don't even try and do that stuff. But I'm quite interested in kind of some of the broader things about what Christchurch might look like and what's going to happen. And there's some key documents we can look at that tell us what might happen in the future. Now, the first one is the Christchurch Central Development Unit Central City Recovery Plan. This is the plan that says what Christchurch is going to look like. Some of you will have seen the pictures and the nice fancy flyovers and have read in the newspaper that the launch of it cost half a million dollars. <coughs> but they did say that that wasn't totally on that. It was in the paper this morning that it was spent on lots of other things as well, which is a relief because it did seem a lot of money. Anyway, there is a section called Streets for Cycling. What's interesting is that there is very little 
in this document on transport. And that's intentional because they've said we can't do transport, it's too big. So I, my understanding is a document will come out later specifically on transport. So at the moment, there's just this bit on, on streets for cycling. If I zoom in, because I want to show you a couple of bits that are interesting, but perhaps slightly concerning. Well, here we go. Here it says, cycling to and within could be made easier with a new network of continuous and cycle cycle routes. So that sounds good. They could, you could have a, a set of continuous cycle routes. The bit that worries me is this little word. It could be made easier. Now, wouldn't that have been nice if they put in this document, cycling to and within Central Christchurch will be made easier with a new network of continuous. So there's kind of a little get out clause with that word. Further down, where possible throughout Central Christchurch, cycle lanes will be separated from nearby traffic and footpaths. Hmm, where possible. I, I would have quite liked someone to have been a bold as to say, throughout Central Christchurch, cycle lanes will be separated. Where possible, it kind of allows them to say, well, it wasn't possible there because it was just a bit too expensive or that car park was in the way or something else. So the danger is that that is a get-out clause. And then it says, on major cycle routes, the safety of cyclists will also be prioritised at busy streets and intersections. And I'm getting very cynical here because I'm saying, well, what about not on major cycle routes? Does that mean on minor cycle routes, the safety of cyclists will not be prioritised? Maybe I'm being a little bit oversensitive here. But this document... If you look at the draft central city plan that the, the city council came out with, it was much bolder. It didn't have any of these words like where possible and could. It was much bolder. It said we will have these things. So I'm slightly worried about this. The other document that's perhaps more important is the Christchurch City Council have produced a transport plan 2012 to 42. Now what they've said is they did this without knowing what was in the recovery plan. But they've said this is a long-term plan. So whatever CIRA or the CCU does... This is a long-term plan and is actually the thing we should be looking at. And it includes nice stuff. There's a cycle network in there. And then you read this, and this is really good. Creating exemplary cycle routes that are separated from vehicles, making Christchurch a cycling city. And if you read the detail, it is glowing about what's going to happen for cycling. It is absolutely fantastic. This is actually from a PowerPoint. I went to a presentation about this plan. This is the PowerPoint. It was publicly available, so I haven't nicked it off anyone and done anything wrong. And there's lovely pictures. Look, nice separated cycleway here, and it all looks really good. So at this point, you're really excited. In fact, if you read this document, which is about 80 pages, and you read the, pa the first 72 pages, you get really excited. The bit that you don't like is on page 73. Because this is from the PowerPoint, but in page 73, the, the bit that's not quite so good comes along. Because what they say is, what we're going to do now is we're going to repair and rebuild the transport infrastructure, keep our economy going by improving freight and strategic road network. And then soon we'll get onto this stuff. So once we've done this, we'll go onto this. Now I challenge you to find a traffic engineer anywhere in the world, in Portland or Copenhagen, to say we've done this. Because the danger, and I even questioned them about this, I said, how do we know when we've done this? How do we know when the network is complete? Because they talked about the network being complete. In other words, there is a risk that we never get to soon because we're always doing now. And if we always do now, we also know that this is the expensive stuff. Building roads is way more expensive than doing cycle routes. And the danger as well is that in repairing this, we don't put the cycle infrastructure in at the same time. And Jerry Brownlee, when he announced his $2.2 billion infrastructure plan last month, he said, you won't notice the difference because it's just, we're just putting back what was there. And I went, oh, no, I want to notice the difference. I don't want to see the same roads we had before. I want to see enhanced, better roads that include some nice cycle corridors and nice separated cycle lanes. And that's not a promise at the moment. The other one that's a worry is this document. This is the Government Policy Statement for Land Transport and recently the recently announced National Land Transport Programme. This is where the money comes from for transport planning in this country. The government has announced a $12.3 billion funding package for three years. The problem is that 0.43% of it is for walking and cycling. The vast majority is for state highways. So some of you will have heard of roads of national significance. I did a calculation today. I was horrified. I thought it was about 3%. 0.43%. So the problem is, as the Christchurch Transport Plan states, this means the funding available for public transport, cycling and walking networks, as outlined in this plan, will be heavily constrained for the early recovery period. For the next three years, there's basically virtually no money for walking and cycling. So we might get some in 2016, 
But at the moment, that's not even in the document because this document goes through to 2021. So that's a big problem. There doesn't seem to be any money to do any of this stuff. So can Christchurch become the Copenhagen of the South, which is Copenhagen is generally regarded as the best cycling city in the world, and it'd be nice to think we could. Now, there are some real advantages for Christchurch. We actually have lots of road space. We actually have, except the Port Hills, pretty flat terrain. We have a minor, mild climate. A lot of journeys are actually very short. People actually like cycling. It's not like, I give the analogy, recycling. Most people recycle because it's easy. It's not actually fun sorting through your bins and deciding what goes in the green bin and what goes in the yellow bin. And yet we do it. Cycling, actually, people quite like it, or enough people quite like it. So we're actually trying to encourage people to do something they actually quite like doing in most cases. And of course, we've got a massive rebuild. Now, in fact, many of these top ones, we are far better placed than Portland, Seattle, Vancouver, some of the cities that in North America are doing amazing things at the moment. Seattle and Portland are really hilly. Um, the climate's not good. We've actually got some huge advantages, so it should be really easy. The problem is there's quite a few disadvantages. Cycling is perceived dangerous, so we need to stop this. Central government isn't exactly giving an enormous number of signals that they're interested in this stuff. 0.43% doesn't shout up and say cycling and walking is the way to go. We do have low population density. That is a problem, but the reality is we're also a city where from one side to the other is not much more than 20 kilometers. So a lot of journeys are quite short. We do love cars in this country. I think we love cars more than many other countries. I've come from the UK, as some of you will probably have guessed, and Paul's there. And we love cars in the UK, but we don't love them as much as New Zealanders. But the reality is that it, this can change because we used to have a culture of cycling and the Danes and Dutch did not necessarily, and so culture can change. And again, this is a big problem. There is not at the moment any indication that there's the money to do it. Okay, so going back to my question, this is kind of a summary. A summary. What if cycling was safer than driving? Well, actually, cycling isn't that risky. Um, in fact, a sedentary lifestyle, in other words, if cycling is a way to get people exercising, the alternative is far riskier. So a sedentary lifestyle is far riskier in terms of heart disease and obesity-related out health outcomes. You've got to cycle a lot to statistically be in an accident or die. We also know that the more cyclists we can get cycling, um, the, the safer it becomes. Secondly, perceived safety is the key. If we, if, and this is, the, this is the answer to it, we need to provide separated cycle infrastructure. So if cycling were safer, well, one is we don't think it is, it isn't that risky, but the key to making people want to do it and to make it seem is, is perceived safety and doing this, getting good separation. And providing separation from traffic I think we will see renaissance in cycling in this country, in particularly in Christchurch, because we have a lot of the geography going for it. People generally quite like cycling. And if we can get around this problem, I think we'll get an enormous number of people cycling. As I said, we have the same number of people cycling, or very similar number, to in Portland, and yet we've done very little to encourage it relative to what Portland and other places have done. So we're already starting on a pretty good place. Finally, I want to tell you a quick story about this couple. They're combined ages 136. They live in Copenhagen. This is where they live. They decided on their wedding anniversary, the 45th wedding anniversary, they'd go out for dinner. So they cycled to dinner. Afterwards, so that's a reasonable cycle. So you can see the, the, the distances here. That's about six or seven kilometers. And they enjoyed their dinner so much, they decided to go for a little extra cycle. So they whizzed around and went home. That is what people in other parts of the world do because they seem it as safe. Some of you all know who this guy is. His name is Jan Gale. He's a planner who came to crisis. He's probably one of the foremost cycle and urban designers and cycle planner and urban designers in the world. That is not unusual for people um, in those sorts of countries that people of nearly 70 will happily go out and that's their idea. I talked to my, my wife about that. I said, do you want to go cycle and go out for dinner? And she was horrified that I would even suggest going out for dinner and cycling there. I kind of do it now just as a little joke, but she gets, still gets a little bit cross with me. But anyway, in the, she's not been here, so it's okay. Um, that's kind of normal. It's not unusual, and there's no reason why we can't get to the point where two 70-year-olds would decide that that's what they want to do for their, their night's entertainment.